Hello, everyone. Good evening. I'm Shelley Klein, historian and director of education at the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education. Thank you for joining us tonight as we uh, mark National Coming Out Day. Uh, with this program, we hope to highlight the experience of the LGBTQ plus community in the Holocaust. And tonight we have partnered with Congregation Kola Me, and with us tonight is Rabbi Doug Alpert to say a few words. Uh, Rabbi Doug? Thank you, Shelley. Uh, it's always still good to be here uh, and to partner with the uh, Midwest Center for Holocaust Education, who um, does such expansive work, uh, broadens the community of concern and, and concern for the marginalized, and particularly on coming out day. And I and I actually I should have greeted everybody with a Hag, hag Sukkot Sameach. It's the holiday of Sukkot. And what better way to celebrate coming out day than with that holiday of Sukkot? So as we um, welcome people into our sukkah, it's in a way is saying encouraging people to come out also means they need a place in which to be welcomed and to come in. And that is symbolized by our sukkah, uh, a, a, a three-walled structure essentially with no need for a front door. It's wide open for people to come in. And, and that's what we at Colomy strive for. Uh, we don't say we're inclusive of the queer community. We say we recruit. We seek out, we desire to have you uh, in our community. Um, and the other piece about Sukkot is this, if you can see it, the Lulav and Etro, the four species, which represent diversity. Uh, diversity in terms of the different branches and the etro, the, the citrus, but diversity of personalities and, and diversity in gender and sexuality. And all of that is to be celebrated tonight and celebrated during the remainder of this wonderful holiday of Sukkot. So with that, again, I say thank you, Shelley, thank you, Jessica, MCHE, and I'm very excited for the program this evening. Hag Sameach, everybody. Thank you, Rabbi. And thank you for the work that you do in the community. Um, tonight we are in webinar format. So that means that if you have any questions, please put those in the Q&A and then I will come back on at the end and moderate those to our speaker. The history of the LGBTQ community in the Holocaust is one that has taken a while to be included in the broader history of the Holocaust. Um, and initially, a lot of that research focused um, on the experience of gay men or men convicted under paragraph 175, which, of course, means that there was huge portions of the queer community that were left out of the research. So it's very exciting to see a new generation of researchers that is working to correct um, this oversight and exclusion. And our speaker tonight is one such scholar. Noah Bordeaux's work focuses on gender nonconformity in the Third Reich and the Holocaust. He is a doctoral student of history at Carleton University in Canada and was recently a visiting scholar at the Mandel Center for Advanced Holocaust Studies at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. It's my pleasure to welcome Noah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shelley. Uh, I'm just going to share my little PowerPoint here, um, and then and then I'll begin. Um, everybody can see that, all right? Awesome. Um, yeah. So as as Shelley said, uh, my name is Noah Leanne Bordeaux, and I am a PhD student uh, from Carleton University in Canada, uh, living and working on the unceded territories of the Algonquin Nation in Ottawa. Uh, and I recently completed a term as a visiting research fellow at the the United States. Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C., uh, which is where Shelley and the team at the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education uh, became aware of my work and asked me to participate in today's lecture. Um, so today I'll be sharing uh, some aspects of my research with you. And before I do, I just wanted to express uh, my gratitude to the center for extending this very gracious invitation to me. Um, I'm a junior scholar and it's through inclusive opportunities like these um, that we can you know, foster intellectual growth um, and spirit of collegiality in, in academia. So I, I really genuinely appreciate the invitation and the chance to contribute to this uh, vibrant community tonight. So thank you very much. Um, yeah, so to commence my discussion today, uh, I'd like to provide 
an overview, I suppose, of my dissertation project, um, offer a, a bit of a foundational understanding of my research focus, and then I'll go into a more detailed um, exploration of the research I conducted during my summer fellowship at the at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. Um, and this will help, uh, I think, illuminate the broader context of my research and the valuable experiences um, that I had while there working with sources. So um, in front of us right now, I've got my, my title page here um, with my title, I am jeopardizing everyone wherever I go toward a trans history of the Holocaust. Um, on the screen here is a picture of Frida Bellinfanta, a Jewish lesbian Holocaust survivor, and also the first female artistic director and conductor of a professional orchestra in Europe. Um, so in this photo, you can see her conducting the orchestra choir of the University of Amsterdam in 1937, uh, three years before she would join the Dutch resistance. And I've included this picture of Frida here because it is from her uh, oral history interview that my title is taken. So the, the more fulsome quote is, I am jeopardizing everyone wherever I go. As a man or a woman, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, and this comes from a moment in her testimony where Frida is reflecting on her time in hiding after the bombing of the Amsterdam Civil Registry Office by the Dutch resistance. Uh, she hid as a man for three months, unrecognizable even to her own mother. Uh, and I'll be speaking to the implications of this choice later in the presentation. Uh, for now, I will tell you a little bit about my research, um, sort of the, the theory that I used to approach it, and then we'll get into, into the case studies. So um, my dissertation project uh, bridges the fields of Holocaust studies and transgender studies to, to foreground the role of gender mutability across identities uh, during the Third Reich and the Shoah. So drawing on select oral history interviews and uh, life writing documents sometimes from archives such as the archive at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, um, the USC Shoah Foundation Visual History Archive, the Fortinoff Archive for, for Holocaust Testimonies at Yale. Um, my project seeks to identify moments of gendered boundary crossing in testimony documents uh, to explore how a trans reading of these sources can expand ways of thinking about sexuality, gender, emotions, and power uh, in the context of the Holocaust. Um, burgeoning literature on LGBTQ plus history during the Third Reich has focused primarily on criminal, legal, and medical documentation. Um, my project expands the scope of this scholarship by including oral history interviews to further consider gender as performative, non-static, um, situated in specific times and places. So this research, hopefully, sorry, will enhance understandings of how gender variance has appeared, as uh, Dr. Laurie Marhofer suggests, in situations characterized by emotion, choice, and risk. Um, yeah, so contributing to scholarship on the conditions of gender non-normativity in Germany under National Socialism and during the Holocaust um, from the years 1934 to 1945, my project uh, builds on existing approaches to gender and the Holocaust, which has become an important site of scholarship since its conception in the 1980s-ish. Um, and while there's been an increase in attention paid to Holocaust histories of gender and sexuality, uh, Dr. Zoe Waxman has emphasized how frameworks used to approach studies of gender and the Holocaust frequently prioritize palatable narratives uh, that reinforce binary conceptualizations of gender. That is, um, in the cases that we choose to study often lean towards simpler stories that fit into traditional categories of male and female. Um, this can hide the experiences of people whose gender expression didn't fit those categories uh, and it can even make non-traditional experiences seem less important. Um, so in failing to either look for or articulate gender nonconformity, uh, stories that can test normative notions of gender have frequently been disappeared by survivors and researchers alike unintentionally or, you know. Um, so speaking about the minimization of complex experiences of gender in the Holocaust, um, scholar Joan Ringelheim um, states that without a particular, or a place for a particular memory, without a conceptual framework, a possibly significant piece of information will not be pursued. Um, in other words, if we don't create a space to discuss and understand these unique gender experiences during the Holocaust, and if we don't have a framework to think about them, uh, we might miss out on important information that could help us more fully understand these histories, our histories. Um, as Dr. Xavier Nunn has observed, 
while scholars have begun to study gender variance in historical cases of transvestitism, which is the word that they used at the time, um, the lack of an appropriate framework has meant that thus far, evaluations of trans experiences have been limited to identity-based histories of queer state persecution. Um, as a result, instances of gender nonconformity that can't be analyzed through an identity framework have not been included in the scholarship on gender variance. So historians such as uh, last year's lecturer here, uh, Dr. Anna Haikova, and other scholars such as Dr. Jennifer Evans and Dr. Alyssa Mylander have remarked on the limitations of identity categories when analyzing non-normative performances of gender in Holocaust history. Uh, they note that identity-based analysis is frequently reductive uh, and disregards non-static situational experiences of gender participating in a historical revisionism that leaves out complicated details in favor of more categorizable identities and stories. Uh, Identity-based approaches also fail to address situational variances of um, men and women who otherwise perform gender normatively, uh, or the experiences of those who disidentify with queer and trans identity categories, so maybe people who don't claim queer identities. Um, Additionally, an identity-based approach to uh, these experiences of gender does not account for the constructed nature of gender itself. So gender scholars such as Dr. Judith Butler and Dr. Joan Scott have argued that we should understand gender as performative, as relational, and as inherently connected to systems of power. Um, nonetheless, uh, identity approaches frequently reinforce binary understandings of gender and make invisible how, how power functions in relation to gender. Um, so there is a need to place uh, these, these gender variant experiences into the historical register um, in the context of the crimes of the Third Reich and the Holocaust, where until recently, um, as Shelley mentioned, uh, gendered analysis has been uh, underrepresented. It is especially crucial to adopt approaches that make visible the complexities of gender to better understand the cultural context that give it meaning. Um, and yeah, this project contributes to, to disrupting what has become an ahistorical narrative uh, where some non-normative performances of gender are overlooked while others are ostracized. Uh, and this is where my research intervenes in the historiography. So I'm gonna talk for a second about um, method, like explain what trans analysis is, and then I'll move into my case studies. So, um, Got another slide here. Uh, so documenting the relationship between, between transness and history is a task that's complicated by the limitations of our present day understandings of the word trans. Um, that is trans as an identity category or trans as binary. Uh, in the interest of a more nuanced history of gender, uh, transgender studies scholars have innovated uh, a method of analysis beyond uh, these limited understandings of trans. So in their in their seminal work, uh, trans, trans or transgender, scholars uh, Susan Stryker, Paisley Curra, and Lisa Jean Moore coined the use of the prefix trans with an asterisk, um, quote, which remains open-ended and resists premature foreclosure by attachment to any single suffix. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, trans analysis makes use of this term trans uh, to denote not only uh, a binary impression of transness, that is, uh, transition from male to female or female to male, but to capture um, the potential of, of the prefix trans itself, meaning literally movement through or across boundaries. So trans um, alone thus underscores the rich potential of the prefix in capturing a broad range of experiences and possibilities, uh, rendering it a powerful tool with which to interrogate and disentangle normative and non-normative articulations of gender in the archive and the structures of power which produce them. Um, historian Dr. Claire Sears clearly articulates this wider application of the word trans, um, describing trans analysis as centered on, quote, the historical production and subsequent operations of the boundary between normative and non-normative gender. Not only people and practices that challenge gender normativity, but also cross-gender practices that do not provoke censure and transing discourses that represent men as feminine women as masculine, and gender difference as impossible to read, end quote. Uh, in this context, the, the concept of trans undergoes a reimagining, um, shifting from being strict and clearly defined to something more fluid and all-encompassing. 
uh, trans analysis takes on a broader role, um, becoming a, a means of exploring a wide range of questions. Uh, it helps us understand the power structures that create and suppress both typical and atypical expressions of gender, as well as other aspects like race, ability, uh, different ways of existing. What makes trans analysis particularly valuable in the study of Holocaust and genocide studies is its ability to shed light on the potent normalizing forces at play, um, especially in relation to race and nationalism. This, this framework allows us to critically examine how differences are constructed and how categories are established in the first place, as explained by um, historian Dr. Howard Chang, who I've cited here. Um, in essence, uh, trans analysis serves as a theoretical model that promises to provide a deeper understanding of the diverse experiences that encompass all lives, with a particular emphasis from this research anyways, on lives affected by the Holocaust. Um, it enables us to explore the complexities and nuances of these experiences, offering a more textured perspective on the history and events at that time. Um, it's critical to note here that trans analysis isn't solely about exploring liberating expressions of gender or positive expressions of gender. Uh, in the context of the Holocaust, it can also reveal how gender boundaries were crossed or challenged in ways that ultimately reinforced traditional systems of power, particularly those rooted in heteropatriarchy. Um, for example, scholars like uh, Dr. Jennifer Evans and Dr. Alyssa Mylander have examined photographs depicting German soldiers cross-dressing while on the front lines. Um, these images, despite their outward appearance of nonconformity, were actually intended to humorously uphold and reinforce traditional gender roles. Their purpose was to reaffirm a, um, a heterosexual masculine identity and to boost the morale of these men who were involved in carrying out acts of genocide. So ultimately these photos illustrate how transgressive gender expressions can sometimes serve to strengthen and normalize um, existing power structures, highlighting the complex interplay of gender power and violence during the Holocaust um, and also pointing to the importance of examining it. So um, similarly, uh, Dr. Lori Marhofer has stressed the limitations of exclusively examining gender diversity through the lens of straight state persecution of queer individuals. Uh, this approach tends to prioritize the classification systems um, that were established by perpetrators, which can result in reducing um, experiences of violence and accounts of violence to what was officially recorded, um, leaving out messier, more unclassifiable moments or testimony moments. Um, in a similar vein, Germanists Dr. Katie Sutton and Dr. Brigitte Lang have urged researchers to adopt, uh, quote, ethics of attentiveness. Uh, when dealing with instances of non-normative gender in historical images and documents. This ethical approach aims to disrupt overly simplistic and marginalizing interpretations of historical materials uh, by reading historical sources with a mindful and attentive approach, researchers can maybe uncover details that indicate uh, agency and self-definition even in um, horrific contexts uh, and context that where it seems like maybe somebody would not have agency. Um, my project in this case proposes an expansion of this method, uh, combining it with trans analysis and further applying it to oral history narratives. Um, I'll do this in conjunction with methodologies drawn from performance studies uh, to explore how gender performance, performances, sorry, both shape and are shaped by the historical context in which they occur. Um, so to illustrate some of that, those like more dense concepts that I have discussed so far, I'm going to transition to discussing some of the case studies that I had the opportunity to work on during my time at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum um, this past summer. So these cases highlight uh, the themes that emerged as I sought out instances of gender boundary crossing, um, sometimes in cases uh, with queer individuals, sometimes in cases with um, with folks who did identify with their with their assigned gender at birth, but who were um, crossing this this uh, normative gender boundary for um, for their own reasons. So I'll get into that. Um, I'll begin by focusing on the individual who served as the starting point for this presentation, uh, Frida Belenfante. So I have some photos of her here. Um, 
So a trans analysis of the testimony of Jewish lesbian survivor uh, Frida Belenfanta here sheds light on how the concept of gender um, as manifested in physical appearance, political resistance, and geographical boundaries significantly shaped her lived experience um, and memories during the Holocaust. So following the bombing of the Amsterdam Civil Registry Office in uh, 1943, as I noted, Frida uh, made the remarkable decision to live as a man in order to evade detection by authorities. So this transformation for her ado involved adopting um, the outward appearance of a man, um, suits, ties, getting a cropped haircut, um, and using a counterfeit identity document um, that listed her as male and listed her name as Hans. Um, she was a, like her role in the resistance uh, was heavily related to forging um, documents. And so that, that was something that she did herself. Um, Frida has noted that this choice to present as a man served several crucial purposes for her. Um, firstly, it allowed her to conceal her true identity, as I said, and engage in the distribution of forged documents um, with a diminished risk of arousing suspicion, especially after the bombing of the registry. Uh, in Frida's case, being perceived as a man was pivotal in enabling her to assume the roles that she played in the resistance movement. Um, she also explained that it made it easier for her to navigate the world independently without drawing unwanted attention to herself at this time. Um, if she continued to live as a woman while undertaking the same tasks and responsibilities that she did, she might have been perceived as needing a partner or as unsuitable for this type of dangerous work associated with the resistance. Um, ultimately, Frida came to the realization um, that even in her disguise as a man, her presence in German-occupied territory was placing those around her in danger, which is where that quote comes from. Um, this realization led her to make the difficult decision to cross the border um, first into France and then from France into Switzerland. So Frida's story serves as a compelling example of how the fluidity of gender during this tumultuous period um, played a pivotal role in her survival and her resistance efforts, highlighting the intricate interplay between her gender presentation, her identity, and the geopolitical context of the Holocaust. Um, it's significant that living as a man, which saved Frida's life in Amsterdam when she was hiding, could also have jeopardized her life when she crossed the border between um, France and Switzerland with her travel companion, uh, a Jewish man named Tony Van Pra, later that same year. Frida navigated the border as a woman. She chose to reveal her true identity and her true name so that she could call upon her former teacher, uh, the German conductor Hermann Scherchen. Uh, while Tony was deposited on the French side of the border and was later killed in Auschwitz. Uh, the Swiss policy at the time was not to accept unmarried men. Uh, so Frida, as a woman, was able to cross through the border, but Tony was not. Um, she describes how the Swiss asked her about Tony, saying, quote, they asked me, were we a couple? Were we engaged to each other or were we married? And I said, no, he's just a friend. The Swiss did not keep men anymore, only women. And I could have saved his life just by lying and saying we were a couple, but I didn't know, end quote. Uh, this situation reveals a complex sort of hierarchy of value that's placed on different relationships and individuals by the Swiss border authorities at this time. Uh, the treatment of Tony by the Swiss border authorities demonstrates a valuation of civil partnerships um, that is like traditional family structures over resources but also a valuation of resources over single men. Um, so a trans analysis of Frida's oral history interview brings to the forefront a series of um, pressing questions closely related to the intersection of gender and the Holocaust. Um, so how did masculinity serve both as a shield and a label? Uh, Frida's experience of using a masculine presentation to evade detection in Amsterdam and then having to navigate the Swiss border as a woman underscores the complexities of how uh, gender performance could be both protective and stigmatizing. It prompts us to consider the dual role that gender played in individuals' experiences during the Holocaust. Um, in what ways were traditional family structures reinforced through border politics or policies, sorry. Uh, Frida's account highlights how Swiss border policies favored married or partnered individuals um, over unaccompanied men and unaccompanied women over unaccompanied men. So this raises questions about how border policies might have been perpetuating um, conventional family norms, uh, even in the dire circumstances, um, like at this time with, with rations and everything. Um, 
how did emotions such as fear influence gender expression? So Frida's decision to live as a man in Amsterdam, driven by fear of detection, demonstrates how emotional factors could shape one's gender presentation and survival strategies. Uh, this prompts us to explore sort of the intricate relationship between emotional states and gender identity during times of crisis. Um, however, Frida is also quoted as explicitly taking pleasure in dressing like a man, um, even though she was hiding, which of course was terrifying. Uh, she got these professional photos, which I was showing before, um, taken of herself so that she could remember uh, what it was like to dress as a man. And she is not alone in that experience. I'll reference another case um, later on. So, yeah. So additionally, um, I guess a trans analysis of Frida's case specifically also encourages us, sorry, encourages us to delve into the role of economic status in Frida's narrative. So unlike Tony, Frida had someone who could vouch for her Dutch citizenship um, when she made it across or when she was being held at the border. Um, her former music teacher, uh, her musical talents, which were supported financially by her family from a young age, um, provided her with valuable connections that ultimately saved her life. Um, this highlights how economic resources and social connections intersect with gender and identity, influencing an individual's ability to navigate the challenges uh, presented in, in these circumstances. So um, I'm moving now to another testimony, uh, that of Mariana Berman. Uh, so a, tr a trans analysis of her, her um, oral history interview provides us a striking insight into the multifaceted nature of her liberation experience uh, while in hiding in Budapest. So I unfortunately don't have any um, pictures of Mariana Berman. Uh, they're just unavailable, but I do have um, some notes here that I'll get into. But so in a particularly revealing moment in her testimony, Berman recounts um, an episode where her safety was threatened by Romanian soldiers who posed a risk of sexual violence to her as a young girl. So she was um, under 10. And when Berman was threatened with sexual violence by Romanian soldiers, her stepfather um, ultimately disguised her as a boy to protect her from, from being raped. So she states, uh, quote, they took a look at me and I wasn't so good looking to begin with at 14 with the schnoz that I had, but he took the fur that I had, took it and made it inside out and he shoved my hair in it. And he said, I was a boy. And so when they passed by, they left me there. Um, so in this situation, her stepfather uh, took a resourceful step to shield her from harm. Uh, he decided to disguise her as a boy, a transformation that was intended to serve as a protective barrier against the threat of sexual assault in that moment. Uh, and in this case, it did. Uh, so the decision highlights the fluidity of gender during moments of extreme danger. Um, a trans analysis of, of Berman's testimony allows us to reflect on this gendered boundary crossing, asking what does the hiding of certain features tell us about how uh, physical characteristics were perceived as gendered? What does this excerpt tell us about how the sexual accessibility of young girls versus young boys was perceived by soldiers in these spaces? How does the transgression of normative gender performance in this instance offer Berman safety and enable Berman's stepfather to exercise agency um, in a situation where there is not a lot of agency typically? So it's interesting. Um, yes, yeah, so Mariana Berman's testimony prompts a critical examination of the gendered boundary crossing that took place in her experience, um, leading us to several sort of thought provoking um, topics like gender as a survival strategy. Um, her stepfather's decision to present her as a boy was a strategic choice uh, made out of necessity for her protection. Uh, the act of disguising Mariana as a boy underscores how gender identity could be used as a shield in situations of extreme vulnerability. It prompts us to explore the ways in which gender individual, sorry, which individuals harnessed gender presentation um, strategically and raises questions about how gender roles were adopted and manipulated as a means of survival during the Holocaust, particularly in the face of sexual violence, which is something that I'll, I'll touch on. Um, also the fluidity of gender. So this account illustrates how, how gender could be fluid and adaptable in response to immediate threats. It highlights the importance of recognizing the fluid nature of gender identity during moments of crisis, challenging traditional binary conceptions. Um, the perception of physical characteristics as gendered. So the act of, of disguising Mariana as a boy raises questions about 
how physical characteristics were perceived as inherently gendered during that time. Um, she mentions her nose. What does, what does this hiding of certain features reveal about the way that society and individuals associated specific physical attributes with gender identity? Uh, it highlights the importance of, of physical presentation as a marker of gender at this time. Um, the perception of sexual accessibility is also uh, an interesting part of her story. So this excerpt uh, invites us to consider how soldiers in this wartime context perceived the sexual accessibility of young girls versus young boys. Um, what does this incident tell us about the soldiers' beliefs and behaviors regarding gender and vulnerability? Um, and like, how are gender stereotypes and assumptions um, functioning here, how they influence the actions of those in positions of power. Um, finally, like the transgress transgression, sorry, of normative gender performance and agency. So this is a, a moment that I think is particularly interesting, but Berman's stepfather's decision to disguise her as a boy is a striking example of um, like a something like this playing a pivotal role in ensuring one's safety um, and a choice that could be made uh, by a parent in a, in a circumstance where there are typically not a lot of choices. So it prompts us to, to explore how such acts of um, nonconformity offered individuals a deeper degree of agency and control within the constraints of um, what was a perilous environment. So how do these gender bending actions empower individuals to protect themselves and their loved ones uh, quite often? Uh, in essence, I guess, uh, a trans analysis of this testimony underscores the critical importance of gender identity and performance in the context of a Holocaust. Uh, it encourages us to question prevailing assumptions about physical characteristics and vulnerability and the exist exercising of agency, offering a deeper understanding of how individuals um, navigated their identities and safety amidst the profound challenges um, that they were facing. So analyzing Berman's experience in this way adds depth to our understanding of the ways in which gender intersected with survival uh, and protection during the Holocaust, revealing more complex and nuanced ways uh, in which individuals navigated their identities in the face of, of danger like this. Um, so these are two examples, Frida and Mariana, drawn from many. Although uh, yet to be analyzed systematically, non-normative gender performances such as these do permeate the record. Um, my research at USHMM this summer uh, in their archives suggests that non-normative gender performance, regardless of gender identity, was widespread during the Third Reich and the Shoah. Um, most instances of gender boundary crossing in cases where the subject identified with their assigned sex at birth were performed out of a need for safety or survival, um, though these performances frequently yielded other emotional results, such as joy, playfulness, um, a sense of autonomy even. Uh, in many cases, changing one's gender presentation represented the choice that could be made um, to empower oneself or others towards safety. Um, sometimes the opposite, though, which is important to, to acknowledge. Um, several trends emerge from the records alongside moments of gender boundary crossing, um, particularly uh, an intersection with children's histories, histories of sexual violence, and histories of passing, so passing as um, a Jew, passing as a Gentile, or a man passing as a woman, ATC. Um, so one of the most significant trends here that I just mentioned seems to be the cross-dressing or re-socializing of children as the opposite gender uh, for the purpose of hiding or moving through risky situations, as in the case of Marietta Berman that I just described. Um, there are quite a few cases of children in hiding being raised as sons or daughters to further obscure their identities. Uh, this sometimes meant attending school as the opposite gender, creating relationships and performing boyhood or girlhood daily, uh, even for years. Uh, David Tenenbaum, uh, pictured uh, here, sorry, um, is a very interesting example of this. Uh, he's a key example, yeah. David was 11, um, and I think in this picture, he's a little bit older than 11. Uh, but he, when he and his mother went into hiding, he was 11. Um, they went into hiding with friends in a small Polish town, and they were provided false uh, birth and baptismal documents. Um, and David began to go by Teresa, uh, pretending to be a young Christian girl, and also pretending to be physically disabled so that he wouldn't be sent to school. Um, David's testimony raises interesting questions about gender, age, 
um, and importantly, disability in Poland at this time, uh, and also disrupts some assumptions that we might have about the emotions felt during this experience. Um, as David, I have been lucky enough to access his oral history, and he remembers um, these these years as Teresa fondly, um, and kept this picture as a keepsake uh, of his time in hiding, much like Frida, as I mentioned earlier. So one of the most um, striking and poignant trends um, that emerged uh, was, was this cross-dressing uh, of children, I think. Um, sorry, let me just see here. Yeah, so you can see him here with his, with his, um, his braids, as I've, as I've described there. Um, sorry, one sec, let me just find my place in my notes. Um, Carolina Tates is the is the next example that I was going to say, and Carolina unfortunately also don't have images of, but at 13 years old she was um, she was forced to live in a ghetto with in Riga, Latvia, with her mother and siblings. Um, after witnessing and narrowly escaping multiple killings, uh, she resolved to leave the ghetto, fearing that the same thing would happen to her. Um, she she states, quote. I have seen what is going to happen to me. I don't want that. I'm going to run away. I was a girl, not very big. I have to be dressed like a boy, like a man. Why? Because only a group of men can go out to work. Only man they take. Women, they did not work. End quote. So Carolina's uh, account underscores how gender played a crucial role in determining uh, the possibilities for escape. So in her case, she realized that as a girl, her chances of leaving the ghetto were severely limited due to the prevailing gender roles and expectations. Uh, men were the ones taken for work groups and women were not. Therefore, attempt, adopting a male identity through, through clothing and presentation became a strategic choice for her uh, to access the opportunities afforded to men in this circumstance. So after making this plan, Carolina uh, dressed as a boy and escaped with um, a men's work group soon after. Once outside the ghetto, Carolina's experience uh, further reveals the compassion and solidarity that could emerge among men and boys in, in these moments of vulnerability. So older men in her work group um, took pity on, on her, the small boy that was in their midst at the time, and provided her with guidance, um, reminders, and care uh, as, they, as they took her outside of the ghetto. So they told her when and where to run. Um, they reminded her to take off uh, her Mag and David. And because of this camaraderie, Carolina found safety outside of the ghetto um, in a home and hid there for the remainder of the war. So this exemplifies um, the, the way in which individuals, regardless of their own perilous circumstances, uh, could extend support to those in need, um, transcending traditional gender norms in this circumstance. Um, what does, you know, Carolina's testimony tell us about what types of escape were possible for men and women, for, for boys and girls? Uh, what does it tell us about how men and boys cared for each other in, in vulnerable moments? Um, these instances intersect with, with another trend, which is um, gendered boundary crossing occurring in situations characterized by sexual violence. Um, so often this means young girls being disguised as boys, um, again, cases involving children, um, as in the case of Mariana Berman, uh, or also adult women dressing as men to avoid sexual violence. So one such case is uh, Eugenia Rothschild, uh, a survivor who would often disguise herself as a man to avoid unwanted attention by Russian soldiers. Um, these cases raise more complex questions about how sexual safety is configured in terms of gender and who is perceived to be at risk in these moments. So while it's true that uh, many instances involve women and girls disguising themselves as boys and men um, to evade sexual violence, it is essential to acknowledge that sexual violence was also a reality faced by men and boys. Um, these narratives when we examine them, can challenge stereotypes and assumptions about who is at risk of sexual violence and emphasize the need for a more nuanced understanding of how gender intersects intersect, sorry, with experiences of violence and vulnerability. Um, many cases I've encountered are also closely linked to the idea of passing, um, quote. This means that people were trying to be seen as something that they were not, uh, not just in terms of gender, so acting like a man or a woman, but also in terms of their religious identity, um, pretending to be Jewish or non-Jewish. Um, 
this act of passing took on a lot of different meanings because it was related to both gender and religion. And I'm very interested in the in the layered meanings that come up there. Uh, for example, some Jewish men dressed as women uh, to hide the fact that they were Jewish, um, which would be evidenced by, by their circumcisions. Um, and in other cases, like David Tenenbaum, uh, Jewish children acted like they were Christian uh, to, and pretended that they were not Jewish. Um, uh, David, as I said before, feigned um, a disability so that he wouldn't have to go to school and undergo any physical uh, examinations um, and so that he could avoid detection. Uh, my, my project aims to understand, I suppose, what these situations can teach us about how people shaped their identities and how they managed to pretend to be something else. Uh, whether it was a different gender or a different religion, um, disabled or able-bodied uh, during the Third Reich and, and the Holocaust. So um, the current trend toward identity-based analysis of state persecution, which I described earlier, does not actually account for any of the histories referenced here. Um, none of these, these folks that I've described necessarily identified um, as anything other than the gender that they were they were born as, and yet they all had these these rich and gender varying experiences, um, performing gender strategically, uh, moving through the world uh, in, in different dress and in different ways in order to be perceived um, a specific way. So it's my, my goal with this work, I suppose, to develop um, the analytical framework that I described uh, so that it might be broadly applicable um, to meet the limitations of current approaches and to include these histories that would otherwise be unacknowledged, which I still think are, are quite interesting and can tell us quite a lot about um, a lot of intersecting um, structures uh, in these cases. So uh, these sources reveal moments of gender performance that do not align with the subjects uh, assigned sex at birth. And through a close analysis of these survivor testimonies, we can observe ways in which gender was performed strategically, how these performances are remembered by survivors, which is also um, very interesting, and what these instances can tell us about gender in the context of the Shoah. Um, Dr. Jennifer Evans and Dr. Alyssa Mylander maintain that reading historical instances of gender variance, quote, as an example of the violence of the past now overcome, belies that displacement and disposition continue to mark hetero, homo, mis, and transgendered people in today's world. That is presuming that um, like violence um, is entirely in the past, is not now, um, doesn't account for what is happening in our current in our current day. So while this work is historical in nature, I'm undertaking it at a time when trans issues are being actively debated by governments and policymakers internationally. Um, even in Germany this summer, anti-trans activists went as far as to question the validity of trans persecution during the Third Reich. Um, and queer persecution. So my research aims to surface um, vital and important examples from the historical register to meet the challenges of transphobia and anti-trans rhetoric and provide a scholarly tool to those working on behalf of trans communities to ensure that trans existence remains a cultural possibility. Um, the outcomes of this research will include uh, claiming histories of gender variants that have been marginalized, uh, as I've described, and placing them in the historical register. Uh, I'm confident that it'll bring to light encounters with gender that have been largely overlooked, especially in oral history interviews to date. Um, yeah, there's a need in this history for a methodological approach um, that can account for complex power relationships and more expansive definitions of gender, not just man and woman. Um, and my project hopefully will address this need. So developing a theoretical model for trans analysis um, of complex historical pasts um, will hopefully reveal the gradation of gendered experiences that are integral to Holocaust history. So um, my work is, is a part of a rich web of scholarship around trans life during the Third Reich and the Shoah. Um, this research isn't possible without a lot of my, my colleagues who I've listed here on the screen, um, like Dr. Lori Marhofer, Dr. Jennifer Evans, Dr. Xavier Nunn, Dr. Bodhi Ashton, Dr. Anna Haikova, Dr. Jake Newsom, and Dr. Katie Sutton. Um, and I, I'm sure there are others that I could absolutely thank. Um, and I'm very grateful uh, for, for the support of this uh, academic community and the commitment to, to these kinds of histories. So I encourage uh, anyone who has been interested in this topic, or you know, if you would like to be more interested, if you didn't find this super interesting, please check out their work. Um, 
yeah, I, I thank you all for listening today. I know some of that was a little bit heavy, but I, I really appreciate, um, again, the invitation to participate uh, in this event. And um, thank you very much. Thank you, Noah, for that. Some really, really interesting research, especially, um, you know, I've, it's a really interesting lens to look at the performance of gender um, through these case studies. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you did your research and some of the challenges um, to researching the, the subject and even maybe the particular people that you picked. Absolutely. Um, I think uh, immediately the archive is vast and not all of these um, these testimonies are categorized as anything or tagged as anything. So a lot of the times testimonies will have keywords attached to them. Um, in an archive, you can like search like, uh, you know, Poland and then people who lived in Poland will come up, but you can't really uh, search like the experiences like this as clearly, I guess. So it was it was a game of figuring out how to, what, what search terms are going to like, um, turn up results that are relevant to what I'm what I'm looking for. So um, something that came up a lot actually was was dress. So looking up um, a lot of clothing articles that uh, people were wearing uh, in photos or people describing their outfits um, would turn up testimonies that maybe had relevance. Uh, once I I found a few things um, such as. Uh, I guess, Mariana's testimony uh, relating to sexual violence and also um, being a child. Uh, it was it was interesting to see how trends started to appear. And there were instances where this happened more frequently than in other cases. So I think um, one of the, the big challenges is definitely the fact that there's not really a, a structure in the archive to find um, to find testimonies like this. And also this is the case with a lot of testimonies relating to uh, sex and gender in general. Um, I know that that was the case for for colleagues of mine who were researching sexual violence, for colleagues of mine who are researching um, queer histories of of gay men or lesbians. It's it's very similar. So, mm -hmm. did you find uh, in terms of when you were reading the sources, was there a particular way that you had to read them? Maybe like against the grain, or did you find? Um, yeah, just did you come across different methods that you had to use to actually get at the the sources? Yeah, um, hmm. I think, uh, hmm. <laughs> this is, yeah, I guess like I found, I was surprised by how um, right there a lot of the, the things were once I found them. Like um, a lot of the times, uh, I suppose in, in testimonies that deal with sexual violence, it's uh, a little more, um, you're reading between the lines with what people are saying some of the time. But I, I think I also was surprised by, by how clear a lot of this was laid out, but it's a beat in, in what is a much larger testimony. And it's a beat that not a lot of people really care about. And so to, to go back through and find this like one moment where they said this thing quite clearly, and then they move right along um, was, was tricky sometimes, but always rewarding. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How did you pick? I mean, I are these the main I assume these are the main case studies that you you picked. Were there others that you had uh, maybe considered? And could you tell us just a little bit, bit about the process of selecting these as the ones to focus on? Yeah. Um, so these the ones that I focused on today, I guess I felt were um, were examples of some of the trends that I wanted to discuss. Um, Frida's is a very well-known case um, in like queer Holocaust history uh, because she was um, a, a lesbian resistance fighter, which is, it's an incredible story. Um, but this, this discussion of her um, hiding as a man is, is not into that a little bit more. Um, I, for some of the other testimonies, uh, as I said, I wanted them to, to align with some of the topics I'd, I'd bring up. Um, I also, Quite frankly, these uh, are testimonies that are mostly in English. There was um, one that's in, in Spanish as well. Um, there are more testimonies that are not in English, um, but I am still in the process of translating them. And it's so I wanted to be able to represent them accurately. And so I made sure that I, I was using um, things from my my collection that I've uh, that I, I've made sure is 
is accurate. Um, but I'm really excited because there is a lot more um, to to work with once I once I get around to to translating. So excellent. Yeah, well, I'm I'm looking forward to. Um, hopefully, we'll get to to read the finished product uh, when when you're finished because that would be interesting to see how it how it turns out. Okay. Someone has uh, asked a question about continued discrimination in post-war Germany. So uh, I'm assuming this means perhaps maybe not these individuals, but maybe people who um, different sort of trans presenting um, yeah. individuals. Um, I am going to, yeah, I'll speak to this. So continued discrimination in post-war Germany. Um, I, I guess it's complicated because um, what we know uh, is based a lot in legislation. And so um, something that was in place, I guess, uh, was paragraph 175. Um, and that was the uh, legislation against sodomy at the time in Germany at the beginning of the, the 20th century. Um, and when the Nazis came to power in 1935, they changed that uh, legislation to rather than be for sodomy, be for a look or a touch, quote. Um, so that meant that uh, you could essentially accuse anybody, um, anybody could be could be arrested. Um, and the numbers of, of people that were arrested under paragraph 175 are very, very skewed um, and are inaccurate and are very, very low compared to what we estimate that they were, especially with people being um, imprisoned. So uh, oftentimes trans folks would be uh, would be arrested under this uh, legislation as well um, and maybe miss persecuted as a as a lesbian or as a gay man um, in accordance to what the, the state thought their gender was. Um, and after the war, um, most legislation that the Nazis had put in place was overturned and reverted to what it was before. Um, paragraph 175 was not. It was left in place um, until I honestly, I don't know the exact years. I know that East Germany overturned it um, entirely. West Germany revised it. Um, after reunification, um, the West German version was on the books until 1996. And so that meant that anybody who was persecuted under paragraph 175 could not speak to their experience or else they could be reincarcerated, um, which is extreme. And so uh, persecution did continue in these in these legislative ways, in these social ways um, after after the war. Um, something else is that uh, upon liberation um, after the war, uh, anybody who was who was arrested or was serving out a sentence under paragraph 175 was made to uh, serve the remainder of their sentence. Um, and so they were released and then re-imprisoned. Um, since that legislation remained on the books. So, so yeah, it, it continued in, in multifaceted ways um, and ways that disrupted the ability to, to get testimony from, from queer and trans survivors. So, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Was a, yeah, thank you for that answer. I think it's really important to um, keep that in mind when we're thinking about why some, you know, it took a long yeah, time yeah. for some of this research to happen because people um, really were afraid to, to speak out. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's also additionally shocking that I think it was 2017 before the German legislature passed um, reparations for those who had been convicted under 175. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, one of the, a good reminder of um, how a lot of these issues are still really current with us today, in addition to the modern, like the modern iteration of them, um, but even dealing with the, um, the Holocaust history in our in our present. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Um, do you have any, um, I know you put up some, some, you know, names to look at for further reading. Do you have any titles of, you know, books that people might be interested in um, if they want, maybe even just like general overviews or any just sort of further reading to maybe start someone on, on a path down this history? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, okay. So Pink Triangle Legacies um, is a book that was recently released by Dr. Jake Newsom, um, who was one of my, my mentors at the museum this summer um, and a, a longtime colleague. And it is it details this, this history um, from the, the war to honestly present day of um, the symbol of the Pink Triangle and um, a history of, of queer folks during the Holocaust. Um, Dr. Lori Marhofer also has a book called Racism and the Making of Gay Rights um, that 
talks about Magnus Hirschfeld, Dr. Magnus Hirschfeld, who was a um, sexologist in, in Berlin uh, at the turn of the century and is he coined the term um, transvestite. He's responsible for a lot of um, uh, modern queerness as we know it. Uh, and it's his, his story and uh, the story of his assistant as well. Um, and the ways that that race and identity intersect with with the research that he was doing. Um, it's very beautifully written. Both of them are, honestly, uh, and I think I think they're quite accessible and very, very interesting. So, yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you again for this wonderful presentation. Um, like I said, I look forward to, to seeing more of your work in the future. Um, thank you all for being with us tonight and um, remembering this important history. Have thank a good night, so everyone. Good night.